Fiji has been an incredible program because it's really brought together both the financial and the ICT sectors. And I think what one of the things we've learned is that you need both sides of that equation to meaningfully deliver fintech enabled financial services to the poor. So this has largely been driven by the way the program was designed and it leveraged a partnership between the World Bank, the ITU, um, the CPMI, and by hosting the Fiji Symposium to support policymakers and advance financial inclusion and digital finance through knowledge exchange, we're able to share the lessons that we've learned uh, from Fiji, one of which was um, you know, to help policymakers in their policy deliberations, you really need to think about how to formulate policies that enable new technologies like P2P lending, digital payments, open banking, digital ID, and so on. And so, for example, in Egypt, Fiji provided the technical assistance for the Central Bank of Egypt and the Financial Regulatory Authority to issue new consumer protection regulations in 2019. And Fiji supported the Central Bank of Egypt to establish their financial consumer protection supervision unit and start implementing a financial ombudsman scheme. And I think one of the things we saw here is that bringing all of those pieces together again allows you to deliver something meaningful in terms of policy reform that will really enable digital financial services. Uh, in Mexico, Fiji supported the authorities to develop um, secondary fintech re regulations that really focused on financial inclusion. Um, and I think one of the other things I'm really proud of that we've been able to do with Fiji is to really advance some of the thought leadership in these topics. So the Fiji cybersecurity work stream, for instance, developed new cyber resilience for financial market infrastructures guidance for authorities to assess their overall cyber resilience, or the digital ID working group contributed to the development of global digital ID guidance, including the G20 digital ID onboarding policy guidance that was released. So I think bringing all of these parts together again allowed uh, the whole to be more than the sum of the parts, and that's one of the great takeaways from Fiji. I think one of the things we're seeing in the COVID pandemic is that the pandemic has disrupted the economic security of millions of families and disproportionately impacting vulnerable segments of the population, such as rural dwellers and women. We estimate at the World Bank that between 110 and 130 million people will be pushed back into extreme poverty as a result of the, the um, COVID pandemic. And so, for example, many families in emerging markets and developing economies depend on low value cross-border remittances from family members working abroad. But we know that remittance flows to low and middle income economies have declined significantly during the pandemic by an estimated 14% uh, when measured by volume compared with pre-COVID uh, levels. We also know that the pandemic has increased risks to consumers. There have been an increase in the number of frauds and scams. Um, we've seen things like fake offers for emergency money, We've seen things like, um, you know, uh, more predatory behavior amongst lenders resulting in higher credit risks, higher non-performing loans. We've seen out, you know, blatant misinformation, whether it's false claims that the virus is related to exposure to new technologies like 5G or to other kinds of, of uh, technological and financial services. At the same time, the pandemic has, has accelerated the pace of a lot of digital financial services reforms to enable and you know, reducing physical uh, contact in financial transactions. So for example, we've seen that pandemic driven lockdowns have led to increases in the volumes of digital payments, starting with mobile money and including government to person or G to P uh, transfers and domestic international remittances. So for example, in more than 80 countries worldwide, there have been announcements of new cash transfer programs as part of the response to the COVID pandemic. 58 uh, countries are scaling up uh, cash transfer schemes. And we see, for example, in a country like Jordan that has enha enhanced their cash transfer delivery system to provide emergency COVID-19 relief to many households, they were able to expand their reach by including online registration systems, automatic data verification, beneficiary enrollment sessions to open digital accounts and transferring payments directly through basic bank accounts and e-wallets. And I think the pandemic has also driven digital ID adoption. It's enabled financial institutions to onboard customers efficiently, but still staying in compliance with anti-money laundering and other know your customer requirements. 
So in Mexico, for example, uh, as an emergency response to COVID-19, new regulations on digital ID were issued in June 2020 to provide additional flexibility to financial institutions to verify ID documents against reliable parties. The authorities also drafted a new law on population and digital ID in December 2020, allowing for the collection of biometric data and the adoption of digital ID. So these efforts have helped to quickly include more vulnerable cust customers in the formal financial sector. And you know, there's that cliche that every crisis is an opportunity. And I think what COVID is showing us is it has, of course, both crisis elements, but it has also presented opportunities in digital financial services. I think first and foremost, we expect it to be an effective platform for regulators and policymakers and digital financial service experts to share approaches and lessons learned um, in order to support policymakers around the world in their effort to enable fintech and leverage it, but also to mitigate its risks. And so we see that there's such importance in the peer-to-peer -peer learning that comes from policymakers and regulators talking to one another. Of course, having experts there as well is valuable, but the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of the symposium cannot be under, understated or undervalued. We also want to um, ensure that the, the symposium helps strengthen the commitment to build the core digital financial service enablers, like financial infrastructure, digital ID, and so on. We want to enable policymakers to better navigate the complex cyber threat landscape. Uh, and that can't be underestimated. Cyber resilience is one of the key themes in this year's symposium, uh, and we want to bring the latest insights on this topic. And ultimately, we want to ensure that there is a renewed commitment amongst experts, policymakers, regulators, and so on, to ensure that women are not left behind. The pandemic, although it has been global, has impacted different groups in different ways, and women have been disproportionately negatively impacted. And gender parity will be a key running theme throughout the symposium so that we can focus on how authorities can bridge this gap by easing things like account opening procedures and strengthening women's access to identification. What is most important is that the digital financial service that's offered be more attractive to her or him than cash or other services. And so we are seeing that both financial service providers and fintechs are beginning to leverage new technologies to offer better designed products and taking a customer centric or consumer centric approach to designing products for the underserved. And as those products become more convenient and easier to use and more familiar to consumers, they may organically transition towards digital financial services. And we're seeing this, you know, major shifts in financial inclusion where previously underserved consumers are now being provided a range of financial services, including access to credit, wealth management, uh, underpinned by innovations in payments, along with new data sharing and analytical tools. So whether it's WePay in China or Orange Money in West Africa, you know, M-Pesa and M-Shwari in East Africa, of course, um, we're seeing that these are bringing services to consumers that meet their needs and therefore they're migrating to them. But I also think that it will, um, you know, transitioning towards digital financial services requires more than just digital financial services, if that makes sense. I think enabling all of the infrastructure around digital financial services, again, whether it's digital ID, retail payment systems, um, things like EKYC and simplified onboarding, uh, and also making sure, and I really want to emphasize this, that we have robust consumer protection frameworks in place. I think more countries are building these robust consumer protection regimes, including Fiji countries, and with the assistance of the Fiji program. But it's critical that as we bring more and more financial services to those that have been historically unserved or underserved, we're not at the same time exposing them to greater financial risk. And I think that's an important part of ensuring that there's a safe migration to digital financial services.